I've written a lot, especially in my memoir, The Great Good Thing, about how the arts schooled me in manhood. I didn't find anywhere around me a man that I could model myself on or felt that I could model myself on. And so I looked for such men in fiction and in the movies. And I found it in American tough guy fiction, like by Ernest Hemingway and Dashiell Hammett and Raymond Chandler. And I found it in the movies in characters played by guys like Humphrey Bogart and John Wayne. Now, the most important character in my young adulthood or my adolescence, I would say, was Raymond Chandler's private detective, Philip Marlowe. Uh, he was a man who carried the ideal of chivalry into a corrupt modern society. Raymond Chandler wrote an essay about him in which he said this, and this became something, when I read this for the first time as a kid of maybe 13, 14 years old, I said, yes, that's the kind of man I want to be. He wrote, down these mean streets, a man must go who is not himself mean, who is neither tarnished nor afraid. He is the hero. He is everything. He must be, to use a rather weathered phrase, a man of honor by instinct, by inevitability, without thought of it, and certainly without saying it. Now, whether I succeeded in that is not for me to judge. I know I did sometimes, and I know I didn't sometimes, but that was the model I set for myself. And so I want to take a look at a couple of figures in the arts, especially in American movies, and look at the way manhood has changed and what the movies have been telling us about manhood all this time. It's a good thing to look at the arts because the artist captures something about the human experience in his time, and once that thing is spoken aloud, it becomes part of the time and has an effect on the time. There's a new book out called The Last Action Heroes, uh, The Triumphs, Flops, and Feuds of Hollywood's Kings of Carnage. It's by Nick Desemlian, and it charts what I think is one of the most interesting developments in the way men are presented in the culture and have been presented in my lifetime. I noticed it when it was going on, but it's interesting people are writing about it now. The old movies, see, I grew up watching old movies because there were no recording devices. There were no VH VHS machines or streaming, so a movie came to the theater and it left. The only movies on TV were old movies, the movies my mom and dad would watch in the theater. The same movies they saw in the theater were the only movies on TV. So I saw a lot of old movies. And in these old movies, a man, an action man, a man of action, was ready for action, but he didn't necessarily want to go into action. Action was not a good thing. It was just something he was ready to do when he had to do it. Here's just a quick famous scene of John Wayne in a movie called McClintock, which is kind of a Western comedy. A guy has been hitting Wayne in the stomach with a rifle, hitting him again and again, bullying him. And eventually Wayne takes the rifle away from him. Let's cut 10. Now, we'll all calm down. Boss, he's just a little excited. I know, I know. I'm going to use good judgment. I haven't lost my temper in 40 years. But Pilgrim, you caused a lot of trouble this morning. Might have got somebody killed. And somebody ought to belt you in the mouth. But I won't. I won't. The hell I won't. <laughs> the hell I won't. In other words, he doesn't want to lose his temper. He's not supposed to lose his temper. He hasn't lost his temper in 40 years, but when the time comes, he is ready for action. Now, then came the revolutionary 1970s, and the image of a man became kind of intellectual and ethnic and kind of inward and offbeat. Actors like Dustin Hoffman, Al Pacino, Robert De Niro, they were troubled men trying to find a code in a kind of corrupt, lost world. It was really in the 1980s when things changed, and that's what this book is about. Suddenly, there were all these really, really muscle-bound stars like Arnold Schwarzenegger, uh, Sylvester Stallone, to a lesser extent, Bruce Willis. They were almost cyborgs. They were almost, they were defined by violence and action. That's all they did in the movies. Here's a scene from The Terminator where Arnold Schwarzenegger is playing a literal cyborg, but it shows you kind of what I mean. I need your clothes, your boots, and your motorcycle. <laughs> <laughs> you forgot to say please. So he's, he's not even a man at all, really. You can't hurt him. There's, he doesn't experience what Daniel Penny experienced. He doesn't experience fear. He just is so huge, so indestructible that he does what he has to do. It's kind of this weird, blown-up 
puffed up idea of what manhood is. And now I noticed this, as I said at the time, I thought, when did men become that? When did that become the image of a man? And of course, you can only guess at the reasons. You're only imposing your guesses. But I thought then, and I still think now, that this coincided with the first real rise of angry leftist feminism. So this cyborg maleness, which would ultimately morph into today's superheroes, these guys who are also indestructible, it may have been like a comforting assertion of male fantasy power at a time when men felt they were losing their power to these loud, angry, nasty feminists, or it also may have been a reaction to the idea that men and women were antagonists. See, this was the part of a feminism that was leftist, that men and women were antagonists rather than lovers and friends, so that they had to heavily define themselves as utterly male and utterly female. Me- women, Movies for women in that time were unwatchable by a man. The old soap operas, which were called women's pictures, a man could watch. They were entertaining. They were interesting. They had men in them. They had relationships in them. But modern Romantic comedies and romances you can't look at at all if you're a man. It's like having a screwdriver dug into your head. So instead of being human beings who are different genders, feminism defined us as antagonists with utterly different personalities, which is just not true. This is the idea of context, which is very important to to manhood. How a man expresses himself, how he expresses his manhood, is going to depend on what situation he is, what historical situation he is. If Genghis Khan is the most natural man, then warfare and conquest express something very basic about men, which I think they do. They, uh, that's why Andrew Tate resonates. There is something natural in man that wants to conquer, that wants to seduce, that wants to be the top dog. Every civilization I think, has a place, a golden age that it looks back to when men could be that thing, but be it morally. So the British have the knights in shining armor. You can be a tough guy, you can be a wanderer, you can be a fighter, but you are the the exemplar of morality. Same thing is true in the Western. The Japanese had the samurai, the French had the musketeers, the Trojan warriors are like that. If you look at the knights in armor and the westerns, they always there's always a sense there that a go, that golden age is passing. If you look at the Arthurian myths, there's a sense that this is a doomed way of life. And if you look at westerns, there is always this idea that as the tough guys, the real man, the basic man settles the west, a new man is required who is something new and something less than this. The best version of this is in the novel and movie Shane. If you've ever never read the novel Shane, you should read it. It's just an absolutely de- Uh, terrific Western. This is about a wandering gunman who comes to a farming community that is being bullied by the ranchers who don't want the farmers to move in. And the family takes this gunman in, and the little boy and his mother have to choose between two versions of manhood. One is the wandering gunman, who's the tough guy, and that's Shane. And the other is Joe Starrett, who's the farmer, the husband, the father, the provider, the guy who can till the land, farm the land, and build a civilization. Adam, Alan Ladd, a, a terrific tough guy actor, he plays Shane, and there's one scene where he's teaching the little boy how to shoot a gun, but the mother, Mrs. Starrett, she doesn't want to see her boy using a gun, and she comes out and scolds him. I was just teaching Joy how to do a little shooting. I don't want to do You ought to see Shane shoot, Ma. I did, Joey. He's teaching me to shoot. Yes, I know, dear. Now, you run along and get ready for the party. Oh, Ma. Go on, Joey. Guns aren't going to be my boy's life. Why do you always have to spoil everything? Bang! Bang! A gun is a tool, Marion. No better, no worse than any other tool. An axe, a shovel, or anything. A gun is as good or as bad as the man using it. So there, there he is schooling the lady on what it takes to settle a community. The man can't always be a farmer, can't always be the husband, can't always be the provider. Sometimes he has to fight it out. And she has to choose between this romantic stranger and the man who has taken care of her and she's married and she loves them both. And so does the child. The child has to decide who, what he's going to be like. Another great version of the story of the two men, the two different kinds of men that it requires to build a civilization is the man who shot Liberty Valance. Uh, Here, the two men are Jimmy Stewart. He plays Rance Stoddard, who is a physically weak but intellectual lawyer who comes out to the West to establish a law practice. And John Wayne plays the tough guy frontiersman, uh, Tom Donovan. And the woman who's caught between them is named Hallie Erickson. She's played by Vera Miles. The villain who terrorizes the town is the great Lee Marvin playing Liberty Valance. Here's a scene where Stoddard, the lawyer, 
gets, he has to get a job waiting tables because he has to support himself. And Liberty Valance bullies him and trips him up as he's trying to carry a tray until Donovan John Wayne steps in. This is cut 13. <laughs> Looking at the new waitress. <laughs> That's my steak, Valance. Well, you heard him, dude. Pick it up. No. Pilgrim, hold it. I said you, Valance. You pick it up. <laughs> great movie, great scene. Jimmy Stewart has courage. He's going to go after him, but he's going to get killed if he does because he's not John Wayne. And in the end, and a spoiler alert, in the end, the lawyer, Jimmy Stewart, has to face off in a duel with Liberty Valance and shoots Liberty Valance dead. And on the glory that accrues to him from that duel, he becomes a senator, rises, becomes an ambassador to England, and is now on the verge, if he wants to, to becoming the vice president of the United States. He comes back when Tom Donovan dies as an old man, and he tells his story to the reporters, and the reporter tears the story up. And famous line from this movie, The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance, cut 14. Well, you're not going to use the story, Mr. Scott? No, sir. This is the West, sir. When the legend becomes fact, print the legend. It's a hugely important line, not just a great line, but it's also a hugely important line because what it means is this. After men like John Wayne, after tough guys settle the world so the women and children are safe, they want to forget it. They want to forget what it took. And this is why you get these people apologizing for taking the land from the Indians. Oh, we're here in college, but we're so sorry that we took the land away from the Indians, who, of course, were taking the land from the last Indians who were on it before them, who took it away from the guys before that. They're not leaving the land. They're not stopping going to college. They're not living in teepees. They're living the life that was given to them by tough guys who fought with the Indians in order to settle the West. And so they, we live in those lies, right? And we live in lies. And what people like me try to do is live in the truth. I love to read books. I love arts. I know, I understand that I'm able to do that. I'm able to live the life that I live because men are standing on walls defending me, risking their lives to defend me. And I never forget that and I never diss them because of who they are. Sometimes people say to you, oh, you can't be for war. You can't decide on whether we should go to war because you were never a soldier. And I say, no, 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 no. Because I was never a soldier, I have that much more respect for the people who make the world safe. So all of the things that make civilization civilization worth having can be done. So now as the country becomes urbanized, the opportunities for that kind of natural male aggression disappear, right? The violent man becomes an outlaw. This is why gangster movies start to become popular uh, and why we saw so many, um, so many TV shows in the 2000s like uh, The Sopranos and The Shield and Breaking Bad, where a man becomes a man by being an outlaw. Context matters. That's why the, the what the show, the book, and the movie One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest is about. This guy comes in who is a bad guy, Randall Patrick McMurphy. He's not a guy that you like. He's not a civilized person. He's an antisocial character. But when you put him in this place where men are essentially being castrated and are being told that they're crazy for being who they are, he becomes a man. I think this is a lot of Donald Trump's appeal. It comes from context. Our freedom is threatened by corrupt politicians. So Donald Trump's loud mouthery sounds like manhood as long as he is fighting for our freedom, when he's just fighting for his own ego, not so much. The guy who has dealt best, I think, with the question of manhood and the two kinds of manhood and the dilemmas of manhood is David Mamet. He's written a lot of good things, but the two great things that he wrote are Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, and The Untouchables. Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross takes up the idea as a play. It started as a play and then was made into a terrific movie, 1992, a fantastic cast. If you haven't seen it, Al Pacino, Jack Lemmon, Alec Baldwin, Alan Arkin, Ed Harris, Kevin Spacey, Jonathan Price, one great actor after another, turning in one great performance after another. And it is about the, this unsatisfying idea that the adventures of the West, the adventures of violence have been taken over by trade. That to be macho is to be a salesman. The guy who makes the most money is the guy who is the most manly. And here's Alec Baldwin driving that home to his sales staff, cut 15. 
You can't play in the man's game, you can't close them, then go home and tell your wife your troubles. Because only one thing counts in this life. Get them to sign on the line which is dotted. You hear me, you A, B, C. A, always B, B, C, closing. Always be closing. Always be closing. If money becomes the measure of manhood, the price is your moral soul. Here's a scene where Al Pacino is the top salesman, makes a sale. This is what he says, cut 16. When you die, you're going to regret the things you don't do. You think you're queer? I'm going to tell you something. We're all queer. You think you're a thief? So what? You get befuddled by a middle-class morality, get shut of it, shut it out. You cheat on your wife, you did it. Live with it. F little girls, so be it. There's an absolute morality, huh? maybe. And then what? If you think there is, go ahead, be that thing. Bad people go to hell? I don't think so. You think that? Act that way. That's <laughs> a great, great, great speech. And it just shows that he's lost the core of himself. He's acting out the rituals of manhood, but he is no longer an actual person and therefore no longer a man. At the same time, I think he wrote, I think Mamet wrote the script for The Untouchables around the same time he wrote Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross. And there he deals with this. He turns the gangster movie on its head by making the hero the goody two-shoe lawman played by Kevin Costner, uh, Elliot Ness, who comes in to take Al Capone out in Chicago. But before he can do the telos of his job, which is getting Capone, he has to learn the lesson from the old guy from the old West, the old lawman, Sean Connery. This is that great scene, cut 17. You said you wanted to know how to get Capone. Do you really want to get him? You see what I'm saying? What are you prepared to do? Everything within the law. And then what are you prepared to do? If you open the ball on these people, Mr. Nash, you must be prepared to go all the way. Because they won't give up the fight until one of you is dead. I want to get Capone. I don't know how to get him. You want to get Capone? Here's how you get him. He pulls a knife, you pull a gun. He sends one of yours to the hospital, you send one of his to the morgue. That's the Chicago way. The man who does his job according to its telos and who lives in the truth even when it costs him is going to face the challenges that require all the finest qualities of manhood. A woman can do that, but women can't. Just look at the occupations that have been taken over by women, and you will see the truth. Without men, civilizations aren't built. Without men, civilizations crumble. What men are, the future will be. And you may say, well, I want to be a man like that, but I can't afford it, or I'm afraid of losing my Twitter account, or my wife doesn't respect me enough, or society isn't fair to me. My response to that, to all of that, is that's all true. Now, be a man. For more great content, like and subscribe. Don't forget also subscribe to The Andrew Clavin Show wherever you get your podcasts.